Let's turn to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. The Book of Wisdom. And Mike, it's so good to have you back. Uh, glad to hear that keyboard. I was hoping we would hit like one of those uh, I'll fly away or something where you could really let loose, but I um, really appreciate having you uh, with us. But as we turn to Proverbs 1, uh, just some thoughts. Last week, I shared from... Uh, I shared from Psalm 51, and if you recall, we talked about David, as uh, David had sinned, and he wrote Psalm 51 as a plea to the Lord to cleanse him from his unrighteousness. That David was on his rooftop, and he sees Bathsheba, and we talked about, and I wanted to build on this principle a bit, that David sought after pleasure and he sees Bathsheba and she's beautiful and he's like you know what this is a beautiful woman and I want her and so David sinned with Bathsheba tried to cover his sin and he come to the realization that we talked about last week of hedonism the philosophy of hedonism and it's where we seek pleasure it is the belief that the greatest good in life is that you seek after pleasure, and you avoid pain. And David learned a hard lesson in this, in that pleasure and pain are the same, two sides of the same coin. Remember, we talked about this last week. Pleasure and pain are the two sides of the same coin. Because he found pleasure that he sought after, but as he begins to be found out for his sin, he has the pain of being exposed to the whole kingdom. Bathsheba is pregnant. How am I going to hide this? Well, maybe what I can do, I can get her husband to come and that maybe he can take the blame for this. You know, maybe I can somehow cover this this way. And so he began to try to avoid the pain of being exposed for a sin that was a result of the pleasure that he had found. And you find out that he winds up having to have Uriah killed. And finally, this ends up with Nathan the prophet pointing in his face and saying, David, you're the man. After he pronounces his own judgment, anybody that would do something like this should surely pay with his life. Nathan says, David, you're the man. And it's like, wow. Wow. And God says, okay, I'm going to spare your life, but the child will pass away. So we see this thing with David that he's a terrible sinner, right? Just like everyone else. What is the difference when you compare what David did as a murderer, as an adulterer, when you compare him to Saul, who Saul's sins many times were not quite so obvious, he disobeyed God. He didn't kill Agag, the king, when he was told to. He kept spoils from the war that he was told not to. What is the difference in David and Saul? Because it, on the surface, you don't see so much. How about Esau and Jacob? That Jacob was a swindler and a cheat, but yet... Jacob I loved, God said. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What's the difference there? What's the difference in Peter and Judas, where Peter denies Christ publicly three times? And it's like, how can we reconcile this way of thinking? Because if I was the one looking on and passing judgment, I would have judged David guilty as Saul, I would have judged Esau just as, or Jacob just as guilty as Esau, and Peter just as guilty as Judas. But when you read Psalm 51, you begin to see the difference between Saul and David. As Saul says, I've done all that God commanded me to do. And Samuel says, Really? Then why am I hearing sheep? Why is King Agag here? 
if you've done all that God has. David responds to this. God, against you and only you have I sinned. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. And there's an element of wisdom and walking before God that we find in David, in Jacob, and in Peter that is not found in Saul and Esau and in Judas. And I would encourage everyone to go and read through Psalm 51 again. I'm not going to go through there. But this wisdom that I'm talking about in how we live and walk before God, I'm going to begin to read this in Proverbs 1. Lord, we thank you. As we look into your word, we pray, Lord, that you will reveal your word to us. Lord, we do come before you and say, create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in us. Daily we need our feet washed from living in this world. Lord, may we have understanding and wisdom from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Proverbs 1, it's written by Solomon, another one of these guys that you would look at and think, how could this guy ever write anything of wisdom of God? Solomon walked before God, sinned greatly, and the, what he did in humility before the Lord, though, was this, that God granted him a request, and he's requested wisdom and God said because you did not request riches or fame I'm going to give those to you also but I'm going to give you wisdom like was never seen before and like will never the like will never be seen again you will be more wise than Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz you're going to be smarter than them you're going to have more wisdom even than like Aristotle or Plato any of these philosophers and the wisdom of Solomon exceeded any that were before or after him and he wrote it down for us for our benefit now why in the world if we have the wisdom of Solomon would there be so many dumb people in the world me being one and it's like what I like about about the King James Version of the Bible and the NASB is that they don't soften the language up. I really like reading this type of thing through there because Solomon has no problem calling a fool a fool. And we would say, wow, that's, that's kind of harsh, you know. But Solomon really speaks it out the way he is. And I'm going to read through, I'm going to read the whole first chapter, Proverbs 1. And then I'm going to comment on it. I'll do a little explanation of what some of the things mean. And then I want to comment on it because I was listening to a pastor this morning. And I don't know if how many have heard of Adrian Rogers. But it's something as I was thinking on these things that I've got the radio on. And Adrian Rogers, he's been dead for almost 20 years. But he's a recorded message preaching on Proverbs 1 and the wisdom of God. And I'm thinking, wow, who is this? I didn't even know who it was. And I'm catching this sermon, and I'm thinking, this is fantastic. Who is this man that has such understanding of the wisdom of God? But I got to where I was going before I got to hear the end, and I didn't know who it was. But then the next day, I get in the car, and I turn the radio on again. And the same message is playing again. And I'm like, how can this be two times in a row? But this time I said, you know what, I'm not getting out of this car until I find out who this is preaching this message. And I stayed there, and I found out that it's Adrian Rogers. Well, I didn't know much about him, and I look him up. He's been dead since 2005. But the wisdom of Solomon that he expounded on, I thought, I could never preach it like he did. But there are just some points here, some points of this wisdom that Solomon had imparted in the Proverbs. And Tyler read this morning, he says that if you give wisdom to a scoffer, he doesn't love you for that. He, he rebels more against it. And my prayer today is that I will not be 
a scoffer, but that I will receive this wisdom. So I'm going to read through this, and there are, I'll stop at a, there's a couple different verses I want to stop to just point out these are keys. But Proverbs 1, verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Again, Solomon wasn't one of the, by appearance, wasn't one of the good guys. He had 700 wives. He rebelled against God, set up idols in the kingdom, had to be rebuked. Solomon, in his search for, um, I guess you would call pleasure, his pursuit of happiness, he records in the book of Ecclesiastes. Like I said, he had 700 wives. He spared absolutely nothing to find pleasure and meaning in this world. He did everything. And not only that, he had the bankroll of somebody like Elon Musk to do it with. Can you imagine if you, if you said, if you've got billions of dollars and a lot of political power, and you said, I want to do anything that I find pleasurable that will give me pleasure, that's what I'm going to do. Can you imagine what your life would be like? And that's the way Solomon did for a while. And then at the end he said, you know what? It's all vanity. Know your maker, your creator, from the time of your youth. That this stuff is all vanity. And he begins to write the Song of Solomon after the book of Ecclesiastes. And you see the intimacy that he develops with the Lord. The Proverbs of, the, of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, of justice and judgment and equity. To give subtility to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. Verse 5. Here comes one of the key verses. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. Can I say that I've always done that? Absolutely not. To understand a proverb and its interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the laws of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. For if they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk pervily for innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave, the whole as those that go down into the pit, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us have one purse. Now I can say most of us are not going to have somebody say, hey, let's go kill somebody and rob them. But what we don't realize is that Satan has refined his traps, and it will be much more subtle than that but we will find ourselves in the same place. He says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, but for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. It costs them their own blood, their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. And then we have the call to wisdom, beginning in verse 20. In verse 22, I want us to pay close attention to. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying. Now before I read 22, and it's a key verse, think of this. How many times have you done something and you think, this ain't going to end well. And you do it anyway. It's like, 
I can say in my life there have been so many times that there's something in me saying, what are you doing, you idiot? This is not going to end good, and it never does. How long, verse 22, a key verse here, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. I was a fool because I rejected the knowledge and hated knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set at naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof, I, will, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Now, this is there. I've heard people say this is God saying, you know, if you don't do what I say now, then when you do turn to me, I'm going to reject you. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that wisdom will turn its back on you because when you find yourself in a jail cell for something that you've done or bearing the consequence of a decision, a wrong decision you've made or a sinful thing that you've done. Then you will remember that feeling that I had that said, what are you doing? This is not going to end well. I'm going to remember that and say, wow, why didn't I listen to myself? And it is mocking me the knowledge that wisdom was there for me all along, and I rejected this wisdom. It laughs at my calamity. It mocks when my fear comes. And I think, why did I ever do this? This was such a stupid decision. Anybody should have known better than this. And I'm very hard on myself during those times because I know that I knew better. For that they, uh, let me see here. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me and I will answer but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Consequences are terrible. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperities of... The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So who is a wise man? And what does it even mean to be a wise man? And I'm just going to touch on a few things because this is not really the main point of, that I was wanting to make. But a wise man is this. What is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? You can find many knowledgeable people that understand many things. They have memorized books, and they have a lot of what we would call book learning. But have you ever met someone, you'd say, you know, he's book smart, but he's practically dumb. He's a guy that can tell you how the engine on your car works and everything, but he couldn't change the spark plugs. He can do nothing with the wisdom that he knows. Knowledge is knowing facts about something. Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. Knowledge is knowing that the stove is hot. And wisdom is knowing, don't put your hand on there. It will burn you. And the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. The proverb means in the Hebrew language, it means putting this and that together. Putting knowledge and wisdom together is what makes up a proverb. That we get knowledge, but we also get understanding. We discern the words of understanding. We receive instruction and wisdom. We teach prudence and foresight. We listen to wise counsel and put it to use. 
who is a wise man? And we can know by looking at what a wise man will do. Here's some things that a wise man will do that we can know if he's a wise man. He will hear and he'll increase learning. He hears, hears instruction and he is wise and he does not disdain it. Have you ever told somebody something that you know to be correct in wisdom and all you get from them is a smart remark? Ah, huh, you think you're so smart. Is this the good Christian way to do things? I've heard a lot of those. And I won't even tell you what I think. But they don't disdain it. A wise person is wise in his heart, and he will receive commands and instruction. Wise people store up knowledge. So they have it. They have a reservoir to draw on when they need it. Wise people store up knowledge. A wise son listens to his father's instruction. And not just our earthly father, which I found that my father, who I, my earthly father, who I thought didn't know anything, now that I am old, that he knew a whole lot more than what I thought he did. And I knew a whole lot less than what I thought I did. What should wise people listen to? Wise, a wise man will listen to good advice. Proverbs 12, 15. Wise people listen to correction and rebuke. That's a tough one because I've never liked to be corrected or rebuked. Wise people listen and hear the word of God in Jeremiah 19, 3. Wise people keep the law of God. Wise people listen to Jesus. Wise people will listen to the teaching of others who are wise. A wise man is prepared. He honors his father and mother. He seeks righteousness and not earthly treasures. Works diligently in all that he does. A wise person plans for the future. Proverbs 6, 6 says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. A wise person is ready to give an answer. I really begin to see that more and more as we start doing the NKU outreach. People will ask you questions that are tough sometimes. We have to be prepared to give an answer. And that doesn't mean that we won't have times that we have to go, you know, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Wise, to be wise, I need to be ready and to serve. I need to be ready for the coming of my master, of Jesus Christ. And I need to be ready to give account for my life. A wise person chooses wise companions. He's able to, a wise person is able to withstand evil temptations and evil allurement. A wise person doesn't consent to sin. A wise person will keep himself out of compromising situations. A wise man overcomes evil with good. Romans 12. I, I love that verse that we're not overcome with evil, but we overcome evil with good. And just a few more of these. A wise man wins souls. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. We aren't just wise and just keep it to ourselves. We share it. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. So with this in mind, I wanted to share just some things that Pastor Adrian Rogers shared. And it's something that I feel like is a real caution for the world that we live in now. And basically he shared the evolution of a fool. The evolution of a fool. And if we look at verse 22, 
Proverbs 1, 22. It says, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. There are three types of people that he lists here. There are the simple, there are the scorners, and then there are the fools. What is one who is simple? One who is simple is someone who is naive. They are very open. That this word of simple in the original language, it means someone who is open. They're very easily influenced. They lack understanding. And you can typically, a young person is like that. They're very open. And I've said before, it's like in children you will see this very openness, this naive. It doesn't mean that they are stupid. They may have a great capacity for learning and be brilliantly intelligent, but very naive. Why do you think there are so many commercials on TV appealing to young people? Because especially in young people, there's this propensity to be very naive, very open, lacking understanding. And then there's the scorner. And I've run into a lot of, of scorners, I've, especially at work. And the scorner is what? The, the, Adrian Rogers says is the easiest way to describe the scorner is they're a smart aleck. It's like when you say, you present the gospel, or you say something godly, something wise, they will have a smart aleck remark to come back at that. They're what we would call in uh, the workplace probably like a cynic or a contrarian. They don't receive anything. As you share something, they have a quick, smart like comeback. And then finally, the fool. As we progress to the fool, arrogant, rebellious, and have totally lost any discernment of good and evil. And we see more foolishness today in our world than has ever been in my lifetime. And I believe because of technology and because of the internet and because of social media that the progression of the philosophy of the fool is so much more prevalent today than ever before. Another reason that fools have become so prevalent in our society today is because our public schools have become like a Sunday school for foolishness. There's no prayer in schools anymore. You can't have the Ten Commandments in a school anymore. And the only philosophy that you will learn in public school is the secular humanist philosophy. Very little learning of what we would have been taught when we were in school. No focus anymore on learning how to add and subtract and to write and to read or history history's evil we need to do away with history we need to study things in school and teach our children things like gender studies or about all these other social issues and I heard a school teacher question the other day are our children so good at reading and math that we have to quit teaching them that stuff to teach them this liberal agenda of secularism because there is no safe place anymore for our children within the public school system. And Proverbs 9 says this, for the simple, for the ones that are in this Situation says, Wisdom hath built her house, and she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beast, she has mingled her wine, she has furnished her table. That in wisdom there is a table set for the simple, for the one who is impressionable, the one who does not need to see the things on TV that will influence their mind, does not need to learn the things in secular school 
that's being taught. But wisdom has set a table for him. She hath sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn here. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. God's wisdom in the Proverbs is given to us first for the simple person, the young person who yet is impressionable, who is like this little flower pot that is nothing but fertile soil in there. That Satan's just standing there with the seeds of weeds and tares to put them in there. And we'll do that, and that's what will come up if we do not sow the seeds of wisdom into our young people today. And I can say that even if we're older, that we need to keep taking in this wisdom as like a clean water to wash out this filth that we have in us that keeps going in more and more and more. But untended, the simple will become a scorner. As I said, a scorner, a smart aleck, cynical in business, a mocker at the university. And we meet a few people like this, that they will mock us religious people. Oh, you're religious. Don't want none of that. Yep. I've run into that a lot on my job. People cynical that will openly make fun and they delight in scorning. They seem to have an absolute delight in making fun of Christians, of wisdom. And I can remember at one of the jobs that I worked that there was a little Bible study that would meet in one of the rooms at lunchtime. And I can remember the guys walking by mocking into being even disruptive to this little Bible study. Mockers, scorners. Scorners defy, a scorner defies instruction. Won't listen. As soon as you present something godly or something of wisdom, of godly wisdom to them, they reject. Won't listen. Proverbs 13.1, a wise son hears his father's instruction, whether it's our earthly father or heavenly father, but a scorner Heareth not rebuke. When someone moves from being simple to being a scorner, the likelihood of them ever being restored to the kingdom of God without some serious consequences greatly goes down. A scorner despises what is good and godly. Proverbs 15, 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. That's what you read this morning. He doesn't love one that reproveth him. Neither will he go into the wise. The scorner doesn't go to his pastor or to his father for advice. I can remember sharing something with, with someone one time. Something biblical. And I don't even remember what it was. To, the, to a lady, and she goes, oh, I'm going to ask my sister about this. And I said, is your sister a Christian? Well, no, you know, but you will go to her for her advice on an issue that the Bible says. A scorner loves not one that reproves him, neither will he go unto the wise. A scorner won't go to a wise person for for advice. In Proverbs 9, 12, he that reproveth the scorner getteth to himself shame. He's going to make fun of you. He that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. And then verse 8, he that, re- from 9, 7 to 9, 8, reprove not a scorner lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. When you correct someone who is wise, they will say, oh, I never saw it that way before. Maybe I had a blind spot here. It's the difference between Solomon and David. 
I see that I was mistaken. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. A scorner is destined for destruction because that's what it takes to correct them. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, Proverbs 13, 1, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. And then verse 13 of chapter 13, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. When a scorner scoffs at the things of God, he's headed for destruction because these were things that are given to us. Things that are given to us for our good and for God's glory. But there is hope for the scorner as, as much as it may be a faint hope but finally, the progression from a scorner into a fool. That this smart alecky comments that this person begins to believe them. Proverbs 122. The fool. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? In other words, people who are the simple, the, the kids, they like being kids. They like being taken care of. They like not having to think for themselves. They're simple. They're children. They're, and we can be an adult and be simple like that. But we need to grow on into spiritual maturity. And scorners delight in their scorning. How long, scorners, are you going to have so much fun with making fun of wisdom? And fools hate knowledge. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners hate their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. The reason that it is so hard for a fool to be delivered is because they hate, they hate wisdom and knowledge. The fool rejects wisdom. Proverbs 15, 14, The heart of him that hath understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. What is this foolishness? It's everything that is against the wisdom of God. All you have to do to get an idea of what foolishness we're talking about is turn on the radio or the TV and watch for five minutes and you will see the foolishness and the things that are against the wisdom of God. You don't even have to be schooled in the Bible to see the foolishness that goes on. The priorities of fools in our government. Fools rejoice in iniquity. Proverbs 15, 20. A wise man maketh a glad father. Father doesn't have to worry about a wise son. A wise son maketh a glad father. But a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. But a man of understanding walketh um, uprightly. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Think about this a little bit. Have you ever tried to watch a comedy a movie that's a comedy. They're supposed to be funny, right? But for some reason, we have the foolish belief that the more crude and the more base and the more crass that you can get, it should be funny. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. It's because our culture lacks wisdom. They lack the wisdom of God. That these things are not funny, but rather they are a symptom of a absolute decayed society that is apart from God. Nothing funny about it at all. It's like getting a report from the doctor that says, you are totally ate up with cancer and saying, ah, great news. That is the funniest thing I've heard all day. You see the insanity of the foolishness, why Solomon is saying it is foolishness. 
Woe to unto them, woe unto them that call evil good. This is Isaiah 5.20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And if there's ever a time, ever time in history that we call evil good and good evil, that good today is to be able to murder your child, even as it's being born, that you should, should be able to just say, ah, I've decided I want to kill my child, and uh, that would be okay. And that's what people are protesting for, that type of thought. That we release, pe release people who are violent criminals back into society and say that that is a good thing. And that we persecute those for doing good. It's interesting because as we outreach at Northern Kentucky University, and Pastor Bob told me, he said, you know what, it is much better at NKU to outreach than it is at Xavier or UC. He said that you see so many more people antagonistic to the gospel there. So many more people who will call evil good and good evil. That now it's even evil to teach mathematics or to require grades in school. So is everything hopeless? Can we say that all is lost. No. And here's some cures and maybe prevention for this. For the simple, for the scoffer, and for the fool. And first off, as Christians, this is what we need to do. It's Proverbs 1, 1 says, and I'll read again. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. What do we say a proverb means? It's putting two things together, right? It's putting wisdom and knowledge together. And that's what this was given for, for this exact situation. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtility to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. We need to expound truth. It's what we attempt to do when we go to Northern Kentucky University. Because there's so much foolishness that people are walking in foolishness and darkness and they're not even aware of it. Because we know that the fool hates knowledge. The simple, he's just impress impressionable. And the scoffer, he will likely walk on by and make fun. But we look for those who still are simple. And we expound truth to them. We expose sin. Proverbs 21.11. We don't just pass sin by. When the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed... He receiveth knowledge. You see, the simple, the ones with the most hope, are the ones who can see the consequences of sin in those who are scoffers and those who have become fools. You see, if you watch on TV, the foolishness on TV, you can see... You can see advertisements for alcohol and people abusing alcohol and you've got the good old boys that are out on their boat and they are pounding down some drinks and fishing and you see the good side there, what appears to be the good side. But they never show you the alcoholic that's laying in the ditch with the flies on his face and stuff. You don't see that kind of stuff. And if you ever walk through the inner harbor of Baltimore, you see the results of alcoholism and drug abuse 
I'll never forget walking there and people sleeping and laying on the sidewalks. And you'll see it here and there in Cincinnati, but not like in Baltimore. And if you drive through the, the inner city of Baltimore, you see the consequences of foolish philosophy and foolish living. And when the simple see that, then maybe they will say, wow, I don't want that. I think I will go for some wisdom. The Bible tells us that God said to Israel, I place before you life and death, blessing or cursing. Choose life. It's a no-brainer. It should be a no-brainer to choose wisdom over foolishness. We expose sin. We let the simple see the consequences. Pastor Roger says that he would even recommend take your kids to a center that treats a center that treats people like this that are in these situations and let them see. Take them to the hospital to see the accidents of cars of people who were on drugs or whatever. And I remember we used, they used to bring a, a vehicle up to uh, Plum Creek Christian Church of an accident every year, and they would have it up there, and you would go, and you could see this, this car that was crashed by a drunk driver. The third one is a little more difficult. Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The third recommendation, expel scorners. It doesn't mean just kick people out or whatever, but what it means is don't spend a lot of your time with people who are scornful. If they're going to scorn the wisdom of, don't let them have an effect on you. A companion of fools will be destroyed. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. And you know, at work, I learned this the hard way. You know, I would present my faith to someone. And if they were receptive to speak with me about it, then we would continue with that type of relationship. But if they're scornful, as my work partner, my very last work partner before I retired, was very scornful. Ha! Ah, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. It's like, okay. And we never had those types of conversations. And though we had a good work relationship, we didn't hang out after work because he was very scornful of my faith and then proverbs 3 12 a very important one express love express love love will tear down walls where nothing else will because this the fool and this scorner they may not like wisdom they may not like to be reproved but love will tear down some of that separation express love proverbs 3 12 for whom the lord loveth he correcteth even as a father the son in whom he delighteth truth and love we still speak truth but we do it very much in love and then the final one the most important yet is we pray. Because truly there is, there is a veil over the eyes of those who do not believe. Just as the Apostle Paul says that over the Israel, the veil that Moses had over his face that shielded Israel from the glory of God, that concerning Christ, that veil is still there for Israel today. But it is also Satan has blinded the minds of non-believers that they cannot see the light of the glorious gospel. 
even as Christians many times, we will give what Chris said is the, is the bad news to people. People that are not born again. And we'll be trying to tell them, you know what? You really should do this. You really should do that. You really should quit doing this. You should quit doing that. Maybe you should just love God and love Jesus and everything will be okay. We have to imp- pray for them. Impart wisdom to them. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believe should not perish and have, but can have eternal life. This is the message. This is the good news. Because I don't want to train a fool to behave well. I want to, I want to see a simple person or a scoffer or a fool Walk in the wisdom of God and accept the gift of eternal life. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, truly there was a time past that we all had our conversations with Satan. Whether it was as a simpleton, not a stupid person per se, but someone who did not comprehend the things of God. Or, Lord, maybe even a scoffer. And, Lord, even a fool. I can say in my life there have been times when I hated knowledge and wisdom. And I hated reproof. But Lord, may you work in our hearts to receive from you. In Jesus' name. Amen.